The movies Poltergeist and E.T. were both released the same year, 1982, when I was only three years old. But I was, thankfully, only allowed to watch E.T. Through movies and music, the demonic forces of Hollywood have direct access into the minds of highly impressionable children and adults. Poltergeist is a perfect example of this because it symbolizes the way that Hollywood preys on children. The danger is in the actual television. Poltergeist was nightmare fuel for a lot of children in 1982, and it was actually meant to terrify young children. And because of its PG rating, PG-13 didn't exist at the time, so parents assumed the movie was okay for children to watch. Millions of children saw the movie, despite the fact that there's a scene where a man hallucinates that he's peeling his face off. The movie was originally given an R rating, but Toby Hooper and Steven Spielberg pressured the Motion Picture Association of America to give it a PG rating, and it worked. Some say that the PG rating was a crime against kids of the 80s and was a betrayal of Spielberg's audience. Poltergeist introduced a generation to horror movies, ghost hunting, and paranormal research. It became like a rite of passage for children to see the movie because it meant that they were finally ready for something other than just cartoons. Dr. Eckel of Indiana University is well versed in both literature and theology and for years he has studied the connection between Christianity and horror. He said that the horror genre is the closest movie genre to the Christian worldview. Every horror movie has a supernatural world to which we must give an account. Second, he said, every horror movie identifies an evil that must be overcome. He also said that horror movies can be an amazing evangelistic tool because atheists typically don't believe in a supernatural world, but they compose a majority of the horror fan base. Discussions about horror movies must always address issues like the origins of evil and the existence of the supernatural. He also noted how horror, especially gothic horror such as Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or the picture of Dorian Gray, teach us about the depravity of man that in reality we ourselves are monsters due to our sin nature. That is the very point of most of the classic horror movies. The whole point of Frankenstein is that Dr. Frankenstein, not his created monster, is the truly evil one. Here's another point. The Hayes brothers, the writers of the first two Conjuring movies, and they're both followers of Jesus, said in an interview, what we've tried to do is create films with redemption. They have happy endings. There's no sex. There's no violence. There's no swearing. It's rated R because it's a very scary story that happened to real people. But this movie is not about glorifying evil, but it's about the triumph of good over evil. Now let's talk about the movie. The Freeling family's new home was built on top of a cemetery, but they didn't know that front. The developers moved the headstones, but they didn't move the bodies. And now these spirits of the deceased are restless and angry. The father, Steve, was the one that was responsible for selling most of the homes in the development, and he and his family did benefit from that. Other than those things, Poltergeist takes place in a regular home. Children are vulnerable, and Poltergeist was so terrifying to them because it involved pretty much everything that children are afraid of. There was the creepy, life-sized clown doll that came to life, and it attacks Robbie, Carol Ann's eight-year-old brother. There was also a closet that was a portal to another world. You had the big scary tree that crashed into Robbie's bedroom window, grabbed him, and tried to eat him. And you have a TV set where evil spirits communicated via the static with the family's youngest child, Carol Ann, and it also caused an earthquake. The evil was inside of their home. It wasn't outside of it. So the children weren't even safe where they should have been. Carol Ann was the complete opposite of terrifying. She was an innocent, sweet, normal little girl. The spirits in the television are being held captive by the dead 19th century doomsday cult leader, Reverend Henry Kane. He was also called the Beast. He wants to use Carol Ann's innocence to capture the souls that are trying to enter the afterlife. Carol Ann was also a clairvoyant, just like her mother. Now, Cain took his followers into a cave where they would supposedly wait for the end of the world. But when the end didn't come, he would not let them leave. 
This cave was also underneath the Freeling family's house. Now, Cain needed the strength of all of his cult followers' souls to gain power in the afterlife. The sound effect that was used for the beast is the same as the current MGM lion roar, which is actually a tiger. <laughs> We don't see Cain in human form or get his backstory until Poltergeist 2. But Julian Beck, the actor who played Cain, was actually dying from cancer of the stomach lining, and this caused him to have his gaunt appearance, and it caused him to look like a living skeleton. He passed away in 1985 while the movie was in post production. Poltergeist 2 was released eight months after he died. He was definitely one of the most iconic horror villains of the 80s. And I prefer Poltergeist 2 because of him and Will Simpson's character. Now, this is how the movie preyed on children. Robbie is Carol Ann's eight-year-old brother, and he was afraid of the tree that was outside of his window. Being afraid of the dark is obviously normal for children. It's programmed in our genes for survival, and it helps to keep us safe. But this movie made children even more afraid of something that they cannot control. The dark because every single night, darkness takes over and there is nothing that they can do to stop it. The tree scene was inspired by a tree that used to scare Steven Spielberg when he was little. When the ghostly inhabited tree crashes through Carol Ann and Robbie's bedroom window, it grabs Robbie and pulls him out the window and it tries to eat him. Then everything in their bedroom gets sucked into the closet as Carol Ann hangs onto her bed for dear life. I read that when she filmed this scene, Heather had to hold on to the headboard of the bed while a wind machine blew the toys in the closet. The scene bothered her so much that they said she fell apart. So not only were the children that watched the movie traumatized, the child actors were as well. The actor who played Robbie, whose real name was Oliver, also had a bad experience while filming the movie. During the scene, the clown, which worked via a hydraulic system, it grabbed and it started to strangle him. The clown's arms became extremely tight and Oliver started to choke. He yelled that he couldn't breathe, but Steven Spielberg and Toby Hooper told him to just look at the camera. When Steven Spielberg saw Oliver's face turning purple, he ran over and then he removed the clown's arms from his neck. We also have the medium named Pangina, who comes in to save Carol Ann from the evil spirits. She explains that a terrible presence is with Carol Ann. She says, now hold on to yourselves. There's one more thing. A terrible presence is in there with her. So much rage, so much betrayal. I've never seen anything like it. I don't know what hovers over this house, but it was strong enough to punch a hole into this world and take your daughter away from you. It keeps Carol Ann very close to it and away from the spectral light. It lies to her. It says things that only a child can understand. He's been using her to restrain the others. To her, it's simply another child. But to us, it is the beast. Now, let's go get your daughter. Just a few months after the release of Poltergeist, Dominique Dunn, who played the big sister, Dana Freeling, she was 21 when she made the movie, but her character was 16. Dominique was killed by her ex-boyfriend, John Thomas Sweeney. He was so abusive to her that Dominique didn't even need to wear makeup in this particular role. She played the role of an abuse victim on Hill Street Blues. He had just beaten her the day before. She ended this relationship on October the 30th in 1982, but that same night, Sweeney drove to her house, dragged her outside, and he strangled her, and he left her brain dead. On November the 4th, she was removed from life support, and she passed away. He was acquitted of second-degree murder and was only found guilty of voluntary manslaughter, and he only served three years in jail. After his release, he changed his name and he started a new life on the West Coast. When Steven Spielberg discovered Heather O'Rourke, she was eating lunch with her mother and her sister at an MGM commissary. He came up to them and said that he wanted Heather for the part of Carol Ann. She initially failed the screen test because she would laugh during the audition even when she was supposed to be afraid. So Steven Spielberg then thought that maybe she was just too young to take the part seriously. She was a little kid. 
but he still saw something that was special in her. So he asked her to come back for another audition and this time to bring a scary book with her. He also asked her to scream. So she kept screaming and screaming until she started to cry. Before Heather passed away, she said she believed that Poltergeist 3 was going to be a winner because she thought that it was the best out of the trilogy. She said that she liked the first one, but she thought that the second one was boring and that it wouldn't scare anyone. The first sign of something being very wrong with Heather's health was in January of 1987 when she began feeling nauseous. So her mother took her to the doctor for the fourth or fifth time, but they kept saying that she just had the flu. Then Heather's feet started to swell. So her mother took her back to the doctor where they put her in the hospital for a few days of testing. They discovered that she had a parasite that she had contracted from well water at her house in Big Bear in California and she was given a drug. The drug seemed to work and Heather was fine. When she went in for follow-up, they did an x-ray and the parasite was gone, but there was some type of inflammation. She was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and she was prescribed cortisone to treat it while she was filming Poltergeist 3. The steroid injections caused her face to swell, which she was very self-conscious about. So she was eventually able to stop those injections and her face went back to normal. On Sunday, January the 31st in 1988, Heather woke up vomiting. The doctor said to give her some Gatorade. So her mother did that. The next morning, Heather got up. She tried to eat some toast but she told her mother that she couldn't swallow. Then her fingers and her toes turned blue and she started to breathe really heavy and kind of fast, her mother said. Her stomach was also distended. So her mother called the doctor and he said, bring her right in. But about 20 seconds later, Heather collapsed. Her mother called the paramedics. When the paramedics arrived, one of them asked her if she was feeling bad and she said a little. On the way to get inside of the ambulance, Heather's mother told her that she loved her and Heather said, I love you too. Those were the last words that they ever said to each other. During the less than 10 minute drive to the hospital, Heather suffered cardiac arrest and they were able to revive her. She arrived at the hospital about 9.25. She was flown to Children's Hospital and Health Center in San Diego, which was about 20 miles away. And she arrived there at 10.45 and she was in critical condition. Her pupils were fixed, which could mean that she had suffered some brain damage. Doctors performed CPR, but this time Heather was unfortunately pronounced dead at 2.43 that afternoon. And according to the death certificate, she died from a combination of an acute bowel obstruction that caused a fatal infection. She had suspected septic shock and cardiorespiratory arrest, and this took place just a few weeks after she had turned 12. Because they suspected a bowel obstruction, the doctors asked her parents for permission to perform an exploratory operation on her abdomen. They agreed, and on finding the obstructed bowel, the doctors were able to correct it. By this time, it was too late. During the final burial rites, before the casket was closed, her mother put a gold chain around Heather's neck that had the word friend on it. She kept the other chain that had best on it. She said, Heather gave me these for Christmas, and she used to tell her friends that I was her best friend and not just her mom. I thought that was so sweet. Heather's death was considered distinctly unusual because she didn't exhibit the usual symptoms of the bowel defect. The defect is usually detected at birth because it causes severe abdominal pain, vomiting, and nausea. And it's very rare for the disease to kill an older child who didn't already have prior symptoms. Dr. Daniel Hollander, head of gastroenterology at the University of California Irvine Medical Center, said that he would have expected for Heather to have had a lot of digestive difficulties throughout her life and not for it to have just developed all out of the blue. He speculated that Heather's bowel narrowing may not have been congenital, but could have developed suddenly due to inflammation. Moderate bowel narrowing at birth may not cause symptoms, but a lack of symptoms before age 12 would be distinctly unusual. Her mother filed a wrongful death suit that claimed that Heather was misdiagnosed and that is what eventually caused her death. 
The operation that was performed on Heather on the day that she died established conclusively that she did not have Crohn's disease, but in acute bowel obstruction due to congenital stenosis. Her mother said that it was an intestinal blockage that had probably been present since birth. She said the x-rays taken, if properly read, would have disclosed that this was the kind of condition that should have been treated surgically. This is the part that's a little controversial and conspiratorial, I guess you could say. In 2017, an anonymous entertainment lawyer that went by Enty, E-N-T-Y, ran a gossip site that was called Crazy Days and Nights, and he reported something that was highly disturbing. However, he earned a positive reputation in the media because he predicted the scandals of Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, and Matt Lauer years before they were exposed in the media. So you can take what I'm getting ready to tell you with a grain of salt. Also, what I'm about to tell you is all alleged. I'm not claiming that any of this is true. Okay, so Auntie claimed that Heather was, I'm trying to think how to word this, that Heather was harmed multiple times and that is what eventually took her life. He said that the mid 80s was peak time for this in Hollywood. He said children would go to the set and they were left alone by their parents. So according to him or her, I don't know if it's a man or a woman, they said that a lot of parents told their kids to simply go off with the nice man in the suit and to do what he says. Auntie said that for the next eight hours, they were subject to every horrible kind of thing that you can imagine. Drugs were commonplace and they were used so that the children wouldn't be so hysterical while they were being harmed. He said that producers loved casting shows with children and tweens. If someone pitched a show that involved a handful of tweens with a dozen tween extras per week, it would get a green light. The faster they filmed, the more time they would have with the children that would be hanging around. From the first day, it was the worst place on earth if you were a child. Executives would drive over to Hollywood before lunch and they would stay at the studio for several hours a day. And he said on a particular show, there was a very special guest star. He said everyone knew who she was. He was talking about Heather O'Rourke. And he said executives flocked to the studio to see her. And he claimed that she was first harmed when she was five or six and that she continued to be harmed throughout her short career. One of the stars of the show, the show was called Rocky Road. One of the stars of the show Rocky Road, who had spent her life in and out of rehab because of what she saw, described the atmosphere that particular day. She said that she had just turned 12 or 13, but she had been shooting for months and she had by this time become old news to them. They knew that she would do whatever they wanted. They always wanted fresh meat. She said that they had finished shooting that morning and they brought Heather out on the stage. The stage was used most of the time for a game show that was taped there and is still on today. She said that she can't watch the show knowing what happened there. She said that they brought Heather out and the first four rows were filled with men who were already rubbing themselves. Heather was allegedly wearing a bikini because the show took place on a beach. So they had her walk back and forth as the lights were focused on her. Then they had her dance. This went on for about 20 minutes, then three of the guys took her to a different area of the studio. The actress didn't see what happened, but about 45 minutes later, she said, one of the three men came running out and said that they needed a set medic. Allegedly, they had inserted something into Heather and ruptured her colon. The ambulance came and her parents were told some crap story, is the way it was described. That story ended up allegedly killing her because her parents supposedly believed the executives. Now, two weeks later, they finished shooting six episodes of Rocky Road and then everyone was sent on their way because they didn't want any witnesses around. Heather appeared in the episode of Rocky Road, which aired in May of 1987. The other young actress in the show was Marcianne Warman. People speculate that Heather was harmed in that disgusting way and they think that is why she suddenly developed issues in her intestine but her sister said that that isn't true but when it comes to hollywood it wouldn't surprise us if it were true though because hollywood is not a good place especially for children